Once Dick Prennicky saw Twin Lakes, he knew he had to stay. But he didn't realize he would be there by himself, living off the land for 30 years. His writings and films record the details of his days and thoughtful reflections on his joy in the simplest of lifestyles. They brought him international recognition in his hand-hewn long cabin on Twin Lakes, far from any civilization deep in the Alaska wilderness. Dick Prennicky was my neighbor for over 30 years. Twin Lakes is about 40 air miles away from our Lake Clark home. Dick and I shared a love of Alaska, good conversation, and helping each other out when needed. Dick first saw Twin Lakes in 1962. In 1968, he built his cabin. In today's world of modern conveniences, he chose to live in the wilderness like the old timers did, without benefit of electricity, running water, or other so-called necessities. Fortunately for us, he wrote in his journal every day of those 30 years. I'm going to share with you some of my favorite passages that I believe reveal how unique he really was. I watched an eagle turn slowly and fall away, quick sliding across the dark stands of spruce that marched in uneven ranks up the slopes. His piercing cry came back on the wind. I thought of the man at his desk, staring down from his city window, the man commuting to his job the same way at the same time each morning, staring at but not seeing the poles and the wires and the dirty buildings flashing past. Perhaps each had his moment during the day when his vision came, a vision not unlike the one before me. What was I capable of that I did not know of yet? What about my limits? Could I truly enjoy my own company for an entire year? Was I equal to everything this wild land could throw at me? I had seen the moods in late summer, spring, and fall. But what about the winter? Would I love the isolation then with its bone-stabbing cold, its brooding ghostly silence, its forced confinement? At age 51, I intended to find out. Could I really build a cabin with just hand tools to the standards I had set in my mind? The furniture, the doors, the windows. What was the best way to produce the needed boards? Would the tin gas cans serve as I hoped they would? Was the fireplace too ambitious a project? Put up the cash on its poles. Surely that must wait till next spring. The cabin had to be ready before summer's end. There were priorities to establish and deadlines to meet. I would need the extra daylight the summer would bring. The most exciting part of the whole venture was putting self-reliance on trial. Dick Prennicky served as a carpenter in the U.S. Navy during World War II. After the war, he became a diesel mechanic, a welder, tended sheep, and eventually came to Alaska to start a cattle ranch. He ended up working as a heavy equipment operator on the naval base in Kodiak, Alaska. Also fished commercially. A serious injury to his eye encouraged him to build a cabin in the loveliness of the Twin Lakes area. If he lost his eyesight, he felt he would be consoled by memorable images of the beauty and grandeur of this special place. In his last years, age and ill health forced him to leave his cabin, moving to California to live with his brother. In 2000, at the age of 84, Dick Prennicky returned to say goodbye to a place he described as heaven. Come on, you guys. Dick's cabin is now part of Lake Clark National Park and Preserve and is being maintained as an important historical site. It is diligently tended by Park Service personnel 
who honor his life and his values as a steward and caretaker of the pristine land and his cherished neighbors, the wildlife of Twin Lakes. Welcome the Park Service in kind of a difficult time uh, across the state as the Park Service was establishing new Anilka parks and he's worked harmoniously and he understood the role that the Park Service plays in preservation of important natural and cultural sites for future generations of Americans. He's something like Every man's Henry David Thoreau, living simply and self-sufficiency. Every day after hours, you know, in the evening, I would make a journal entry, you know. And I had uh, six by nine uh, notebooks, you know. Uh, and over my, a period of 30 years, I accumulated 60 pounds of those journal notebooks. I do know that I carried a pedometer one whole year from daylight to dark and it registered 3,081 miles. Needs, I guess that's what bothers so many folks. They keep expanding their needs until they are too dependent on too many things and too many other people. I wonder how many things in the average American home could be eliminated if the question were asked, must I really have this? Funny thing about comfort, most people don't work hard enough physically anymore, and comfort is not easy to find. It is surprising how comfortable a hard bunk can be after you've come down off a mountain. No worries about wildlife, that's for sure. Cow moose will give you more concern than, than a grizzly bear. She can, she can make you wish you wasn't there. Did I ever carry a gun? A few times if I wasn't packing something else, but I would sooner pack a roll of film than a gun. I was basically born and raised there. I was born in 1964. And um, my grandfather, who I was living with, Babe Allsworth, was uh, the person that would bring Dick his mail. And when Grandpa was coming up, we go out and get Dick a sack of potatoes or uh, the rolled oats that he had ordered. When my brother and I were about 11, 12, 13 years old, we came up here and Dick invited us up to stay with him. And I think we stayed here for about 10 days each time. And I think it was an eye-opener probably for Dick as much as anybody. Going from a bachelor to having two boys here that were just about teenagers. And first... At last, Leon and Sig had arrived at Twin Lakes. Babe turned her around and tied the tail to a tree. Out came the little guys with their sleeping bags. What are we going to climb a mountain? How about Black Mountain? I don't think I can make it all the way to the top. Let's go back and try fishing. Will we see some sheep and can we get real close? Questions, questions, questions. I had cooked a fresh kettle of beans early. It was noon Port Allsworth time. When do we eat? No eating till 12 Twin Lakes time. But they had to taste those beans. I was busy on the beach and could hear that lid carefully being replaced every few minutes. Much tasting going on in the cabin. As a kid, sometimes you might be picky in your food, but I never can remember him making it dish of something that, you know, it was always good, sourdoughs, beans. We made ready to paddle down to Blueberry Hill for a better look. 
Leon on the paddle. And I was surprised how that little 10 year old could stay at it. We would pick blueberries to have some topping for hot cakes. Eager little guys when it came to picking berries. Leon could keep up with me. Sig was slower and had to eat them from his pail. No eating from the pail, according to Leon. Nearly two gallons total when we worked our way out of the blueberry country. And then I remember usually we were here in the fall and we'd pick blueberries and put them on his pancakes. And following spring, a sow bear came out with two uh, cubs of that year and he watched them for a while and I guess these cubs were full of a lot of mischief and, and so he named them Leon and Sig and after us. It had been a pretty good day. 15 sheep, mothers, fathers, and babies, two caribou bulls, and a big bear, plus three fish caught. All this would go into their journal in the morning as it was time to hit the hay. The little guys hadn't turned in five minutes until they were asleep. Distance is relative. A trip for me down to the lower end of the lower lake takes about three hours by canoe if I don't have a wind to fight. That's a distance of about eight and a half miles. With a motor on the canoe, I can make the trip in under an hour, but a motor's noise stills the sounds of the wilderness. If the weather turns sour, make your job fit the day. Grandmother Nature is in control, and you better just wait until she sees fit to give you the weather that is right for another job you have to do. Nature provides so many things if one has the eye to notice them. Several stumps with just the right flare gave me my wooden hinges. I realize that men working together can perform miracles, such as sending them to walk on the surface of the moon, but there's also a need for an individual sometime in his life to forget the world of parts and pieces and put something together on his own. If you don't need it to eat, well, don't kill it. Hmm? That's what I thought. To me, it was just simple, living one day to the next, you know, and that ain't hard to do. I have found that some of the simplest things have given me the most pleasure. They didn't cost me a lot of money either. The world is full of such things. Twin Lakes is in the territory of the Dedina Athabascans, whose values require them to leave no footprints. They were once called the Strangers of the North because there was so little sign left of their being on the land. Dick Prennicky asks others to do likewise. Respect the land, the wildlife, and the cabin. Take care of it as though you carved it with your own hands. Well, neighbor, good to see you again. And uh, you take care of yourself. Don't chase girls or anything, and we'll see you somewhere <laughs> on the trail, okay? Here, Jay, I got a little something I want to give you. For gosh sakes. I call this the Miller Creek Grizzly. <laughs> well, that's a dandy, by nice. golly. But a piece of moose like antler? Have it. Yeah, this is moose antler. Oh, boy. That's sharp for an all get out. Well, thank you very much, old boy. I appreciate it.